Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, thank you for giving me a slot to speak at this event. Um, very interesting topic uh, for debate. Very topical land reform, a Christian ethical response. I think the first thing I would say, just picking up a point Murray made, um, I don't think there is a single Christian view on these issues. Uh, I spent um, a large part of the early part of last year touring the country with Dave Thompson's colleague John Mason. Uh, going around churches um, debating independence, uh, hopefully in, in, in quite a graceful manner. And uh, it became very apparent during that whole debate that there wasn't an exclusive Christian viewpoint on that question of independence. You could argue the case happily from, from, from either side, as indeed we tried to do. So uh, I'd like to give you my own, my own thoughts on, on, on this particular debate and, and some Christian perspectives if I can. And I caught maybe the second half of Jamie's uh, presentation, which I thought was very interesting. In fact, stole some of my lines, Jamie, Sorry, that, that I was going to, I was going to, to, to use. And I think my starting point for all this, my, my central thesis, I suppose, is that land use matters more than land ownership. How land is used matters more than who actually owns the land. And at the core of this, theological, I think, is, is the principle of stewardship. Because Psalm 24 tells us the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. And in Genesis, as we've heard, uh, the Lord put man in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So man is on earth to look after the land uh, for God and be for future uh, generations. And I think that is the, the core issue we have to address when approaching land use issues, land ownership issues. Uh, this question of stewardship. Incidentally, I was very taken with um, Jamie's illustration uh, around borrowed books. It's a very, very Christian response, I have to say, to borrowed books. You look after them better than your own. I wish we were all like that. It brings to mind the old joke, you know, what is the fastest car in the world? It is, of course, a rental car. Uh, why? Because if you have your own car, you probably look after it a bit better than one that doesn't belong to you. And sadly, because we live in a fallen world and not a Christ-like world, not everybody has Jamie's attitude towards other people's property, uh, as sometimes the case. Now, um, there is an absolutist view of land ownership that Dave Thompson quoted, I think he was quoting from the, the Duke of Sutherland. I think that view, uh, if it was ever wildly, wildly held, uh, is certainly not widely held today. I think it's a very outdated view that, that people who own land can do anything they like with it and nobody else has an interest. And I say that for two reasons. First of all, I think there is a, there is a public interest in land use and always has been. That is illustrated today uh, by the fact that a lot of what people do on land in a rural context has an element of public subsidy attached to it. So if you're involved in agriculture, you will get public subsidy through the Common Agricultural Policy. If you're involved in forestry, you might well get some level of uh, public uh, grant. If you're involved in any sort of economic activity in tourism, there might be some, some level of public subsidy. And indeed, if you're involved in renewable energy projects, you'll get um, substantial levels of public subsidy. So clearly, where there's a, a, a public payment coming, then there is a public interest that follows. And secondly, the principle we have in relation to public land, sorry, uh, rural land in Scotland, is that everybody has the right to enjoy it. So we have the opportunity as citizens to walk over rural land, we have the opportunity to cycle over it, we can climb, we can, we can camp, as long as we do all these things responsibly. All these rights were reinforced in the last Land Reform Act, but I think many of us would take the view that that all that act did was, was restate what we'd understood through the law previously, that we have the right to do these things as long as we act responsibly. And I, I remember doing a radio debate earlier in the year with one of uh, Dave Thompson's colleagues who was talking about <coughs> the fact that you know, Scotland should not have a private playground for the rich, which I thought was a very uh, slanted uh, view of land in Scotland, because there are no private playgrounds in Scotland. Any part of Scotland... As long as you act responsibly, you can walk over, you can climb, you can cycle on, and you can wild camp in. Uh, there are no play, private playgrounds. What we should, in fact, do is have an approach to land that says uh, we should, as long as we respect each other, do all these things. People want to, to, to uh, 
hunt, if they want to stalk, if they want to shoot, if they want to fish, that's fine. There's plenty of room. Scotland's a big country. There's space for everybody to enjoy these things. There's space for us to do all these other activities like, like walking and climbing and camping and cycling. As long as we respect each other, we can do all these things. So I don't think this concept of private playgrounds for the rich actually helps in the debate because it's a bit of a, a, bit of a caricature. So I think ownership, who owns the land, matters less than who uses it. And if we look at land use, we need to say, how do we see the best economic benefit from land, the best support for community from land? Jamie was talking about how we use land to benefit the poor. Um, I have visited a great many uh, estates in, in, in Persia, where I live, and also in the Highlands. What you'll find in many sporting estates is they have a level of economic activity that supports um, a level of local employment that otherwise would be very difficult to sustain. So I was visiting an estate just a few weeks ago in uh, Loch Erne in Persia, and the gamekeeper was demonstrating to me um, the economic benefit to the area because it, in, a, in, a, in, in the period between September and February, which, you know, in a tourist point of view, is, is very much the down season, particularly this time of year, they have bookings from people coming from elsewhere in Scotland, from England, from uh, America, from other parts of Europe. They're coming in to enjoy sporting activities. They're making bookings in local hotels and B&Bs. They're spending money in local restaurants and bars. They're using the local shops, buying petrol at a local filling station, and so on. And the economic benefit to the area actually is very considerable. And I think many estates have actually hidden their light under a bushel in this respect and not demonstrated the widespread economic benefit that there, that there is to the local area from the way they operate uh, their activities. And I don't think we should see these things in any way antiquated or old-fashioned or not of value. I think they are of great value. They are sustaining employment and sustaining rural uh, communities. There are bad cases. I quite accept that. There are bad cases. Um, uh, well, I think overall, I think the states in Scotland are well run, well managed, and sustain a good level of economic activity. And if we're going to tackle the bad cases, then I think we need to be careful about the law of unintended consequences. Uh, that if we uh, take measures to try and drive out bad behaviour, that doesn't actually deter good landlords and good levels of investment, which we require to keep the rural economy going. <coughs> Now, the Land Reform Bill, which Dave Thompson mentioned, um, uh, has been published. We're look, uh, very much looking look forward to Friday to seeing uh, the committee's uh, report to see what it says. It is proclaimed by the Scottish Government as a radical. Now, when a politician says they're going to do something radical, that's when you just start counting the spoons. Um, because uh, politicians who do radical things often get it wrong. And I think we need to be very careful uh, when we look at these issues to see exactly what is proposed and exactly the impact they will have. In actual fact, I don't think the Land Reform Bill is radical at all. I think it's actually quite a modest set of proposals. And none the worse for it. Um, so I think the measures to improve transparency around land ownership are entirely sensible and uh, unobjectionable. And I think if that helps reduce uh, opportunities for uh, tax avoidance or worse still, tax evasion, I think that's got to be a good thing. Um, I think uh, the measures around sporting rates um, have not been properly thought through. Um, I think the cost of collection uh, of sporting rates may well prove to be more expensive than the actual money they will, they will raise for the public purse. Uh, and we'll see what the committee makes of that. I, I was looking at some of the evidence, and I think that's all a bit of a mess. The proposals which are not in this bill, which, which might follow to change succession law in Scotland, are deeply worrying. Deeply worrying, not so much for large estates, but, but deeply worrying for family farmers who like to pass family farms on down through the generations. And I think um, if the succession law changes are anything like some of the things that the Law Commission have been talking about, I think we need to be very concerned about the pattern of land ownership uh, that might, that might uh, follow from that, but more particularly the impact on family farms, many of which are struggling at the moment to be economically viable, but if you break them up into even smaller units, I think you will have a very negative impact on the rural uh, economy. I thought some of the more interesting responses to the Land Reform Bill came from the likes of the Scottish Gamekeepers Association, whose members' livelihoods depend upon current patterns of land ownership, and they're very concerned about some aspects, particularly the sporting rates, and the National Farmers Union of Scotland, 
who again were concerned about sporting rights and were concerned about potential succession changes. But the bill itself is not particularly radical. I think what's perhaps more interesting, as Dave Thompson said, is that there is to be uh, a commission where that takes us and what all that means. I think we are approaching these issues, what we need is a sensible evidence-led approach, which is all about looking at how we sustain a rural economy, how we sustain a good number of jobs uh, supporting communities, rather than an approach that is all about righting historic wrongs. And to me, this whole debate is bedeviled around what people like the Duke of Sutherland did 200 years ago, which doesn't help the discussion today. Uh, Professor Jim Hunter has just published a book, some of you might have seen uh, about what happened in the, in the wake of the Sutherland clearances and how people from Sutherland went to, uh, to, to Canada and made new lives. Uh, of course, many people from Scotland went to all parts of the world, to, to the Americas, to Australia and New Zealand, and made great lives for themselves. These were not empty lands. There were people living there. What happened to them? They were conveniently disposed of. So if we're worried about uh, righting old wrongs in Scotland in terms of land reform, maybe we should think about all the Scots who went elsewhere in the world and took land from other people. If we're going to start giving the land back to its original owners, who knows where that will take us as a policy. So I think in closing, uh, I would say this. I don't think land ownership patterns are in themselves the main issue. I think the main issue is how we make sure we have good quality land use in the public interest that sustains a strong and vibrant rural community. I think we've done pretty well in Scotland. There are a few bad examples, but overall, I think we've done pretty well in Scotland in securing that. Let's be aware of the law of unintended consequences, whereby if we try to be too radical in changing the law, we actually make things worse rather than better. <laughs>